Hello and welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. On behalf of the Canadian Consulates General of Canada to Miami and the Southeast US, I would like to start off by welcoming you to the second conversation of the Climate Change and Environmental Justice event series, focusing on communities in Canada and the United States Southeast. This series is timely as world leaders have just recently concluded COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. COP26 was a significant milestone as signatories to the Paris Agreement gathered to double down on climate action by setting more ambitious targets and planned acceleration for the global shift to clean energy, clean technology, and clean growth. Given today's topic of climate change and indigenous arts, another window of opportunity has been presented to highlight the things that have been done to underscore the known effects of our climate crisis on indigenous cultures and arts. It is, it is also an opportunity to reveal how much work we have yet to do. The Canada Council for the Arts has committed itself to supporting Indigenous creation and the renewal of the relationship between Indigenous artists and Indigenous and non-Indigenous audiences. With that commitment, the Council set an ambitious goal of raising 18.9 million in 2020 to 2021 to pledge to Indigenous artists, groups, and arts organizations. They were proud to report that they exceeded that goal, raising a total of 23.7 million. The Council have also developed a five-year strategic plan from 2021 to 2026 to address the continued impact of climate change on the many Indigenous communities across Canada. This plan will include perspectives from Indigenous artists and organizations to help create meaningful measures that can be implemented that will integrate environmental justice with arts and culture. The Government of Canada has also pledged to do more. Just days ago, the Honorable Mark Miller, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations visited First Nations communities in Alberta. He noted the tremendous work First Nation and Indigenous communities had undertaken in diversifying their economies, as well as preserving cultures, traditions, and languages. Tremendous strides are continuing to be made across civil society, academic, industry, and individuals to counteract and combat climate change and achieve environmental equity. As we will learn today, those advances must include Indigenous arts. I would like to acknowledge and thank our distinguished panel of speakers for their amazing leadership on this topic and whom you will get to meet along with our moderator, Dr. Leanne Howe, in just a few moments. I know that all of our experts have a wealth of information to share with you, and I hope that today's event will help lay the groundwork for future and expanded cross-border collaboration in our shelled efforts in, in tackling climate change and preserving indigenous cultures and arts. Finally, I would like to thank the Coasts, Climates, the Humanities, and the Environment Consortium and the University of Georgia's Institute of Native American Studies for their partnership in this event series. Once again, thank you to our panelists and to all of you for being here with us today. And without further ado, I would like to turn the conversation over to Dr. Howe and the introduction of our panel participants and the formal beginning of today's event. Dr. Howe is the interim director for the University of Georgia's Institute of Native American Studies. Thank you, mercy. Thank you, Ash. Uh, I'm very, very honored to be here and with these uh, wonderful presenters on climate change and represent the University of Georgia in this, this discussion. And I want to let everyone know we are recording this conversation and I believe this will, the uh, recording will be available to those for classrooms in the future. And um, just by letting us know, we'll be happy to make those available or at least the link available to the public. So without um, any, any uh, further comments, um, our panelists today uh, will be introducing themselves but again, um, I would like to thank Jennifer Forrester, Janet Rogers, um, Beth Roach, Marianne Nicholson, and Carla Hemlock for being with us today and giving their time and energies to this important topic. Um, I, I told um, uh, Dave that, that I had some, uh, I had found some reports and I'll just give you um, a comment from one of our tribal leaders in Oklahoma. Well, he was a tribal elder, let me put it that way, who said to us in 19, uh, September, 1950, quote, um, 
He said, since the atomic tests, I believe the chemicals have interfered with air and clouds. Um, the clouds I see are no longer in the skies and I can't give you a good prediction. But he did say that he thought there would be a hard cold snap in the middle of January to the 1st of April because the leaves on most of the hardwood trees remained on limbs late into the fall. I say this as a way of introducing how our, our community looked at the weather, we called it the weather, and looked at climate. We had people who studied that and reported to our communities on uh, based on the uh, natural world and the environment in which we were living. So um, Robert S. Kerr, uh, Senator from Oklahoma in 1950, um, created an, um, a, a recording of the reports from tribes throughout Oklahoma and go, and some tribes responded from uh, Minnesota and the Pueblos. So that gives us some kind of idea. Most of these reports were, were worried about the climate and what was happening to um, their communities. So with that, um, I will begin the program today by calling on um, Jennifer Forrester, who had taught, who had um, uh, graciously said she would go first. Yes, thank you, Leanne, um, and so thank good to be here, everyone. Um, I'm excited to hear from everyone. This is such a diversity of artists today, with all of your different practices. Um, so I, um, I'll introduce myself, uh, Jennifer Forrester, Chahojif Garos, Umalegara Ojax, Monomez and Echas Swalgi Echuste Omas, Lojibogadari Umadalwados, San Francisco Legedos. I, um, my name is Jennifer Forrester. I'm a poet and writer and teacher, and I live here in San Francisco on the Ramatish Ohlone lands, and that's where I'm chiming in from today. Uh, my mother's family is Muskogee from Tulsa. Um, and um, I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about, I've been thinking a lot about this as a poet in this era that we are alive in today, what can poetry do? Um, and so thinking about it, I think, well, writing is an art of storytelling. Uh, we may not be able to totally absorb or understand the facts or the science or the news, um, but we pay attention to stories in a different way, in a more embodied way. Stories will jolt us awake. And I think poetry as an aspect of story and song is a deeper embodiment, at least to me, of the awareness that stories can open, awe and awareness. Um, we can understand ourselves, our pasts and our futures in terms of story, metaphor, song, rhythm and image. I think poetry is unique and therefore is part of this activation that we need to live because it is a language of transformation. Um, and we are at a point where we absolutely must transform. Poetry is transformative. It is a language of change because the language of the poem is multidimensional. Uh, poetry can reorganize our perception of the known and the imaginary and challenges our codes of cognition, expanding our field of vision and insight. It challenges what is deemed legible by dominant language and society. In this way, it also expands the possibilities of legibility. Poetry is also about interconnectivity, resonance and listening. Poetry can reconnect our spirits with our inherent interconnectivity, which means we are reconnected to the fact that we are not isolated from the natural world, that we are one organism, one system. And I'd like to see, you know, as indigenous people, I think we deeply understand that. I think humans deeply understand that, but I think many have forgotten. And we need that aspect of art that helps us see and feel the connectivity that is us. Um, I think I'll stop there and I have more to talk about, but that's that'll just be my intro. Um, all right, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jennifer. Our next speaker is Marianne Nicholson. Where are you, Marianne? There you go. Okay, look, Hesla. No, I'm a local questions. Um, my English name is Marianne Nicholson. Um, I'm calling in from uh, Victoria, BC, which is not my traditional territory. It's the traditional territory of um, the Lekwungen, and uh, I'm somewhere kind of between their territory and Malahat territory. Um, I, I'm a visual artist. Uh, I work in many mediums, um, painting, photography, installation, um, carving. Uh, I come from a small village on the coast of so-called British Columbia. Uh, our, our village is small, um, but we've lived there from time immemorial. Uh, literally our origin story situates us on that river, uh, the Gwaii River. And so I, I partly grew up there and I, I partly grew up in Victoria. Um, when living at home, uh, we, experience and see much of what is happening in the land. And uh, we've seen not just the industrial desecration of our territories through logging uh, and the fish farms, um, but we see the change in climate, in particular how it's affecting um, the, the fisheries. So in 2010, um, we suffered the largest flood that we had ever experienced uh, in, in living memory and probably in all time. Uh, the, the flood reached nine feet and the entire community was evacuated by helicopter. And, and this really impacted me. I, I had been doing a tremendous amount of work, uh, kind of social political work in regards to indigenous uh, land rights and title. Um, but but when this happened to my home community, it, it was such a shock to the system, and um, it was devastating. And and I have to say, like it was a tremendous amount of work to rebuild the community, but they did it. In the meantime, though, because people were impacted and they left, many of them did not come back. And currently, we're we're looking at a situation at home where out of the five to six hundred members that we have. There's only about 65, 70 who still live there. And I can't stress enough the importance of our place in the land to remain in the place that our ancestors chose for us when they, and what they say is when daylight first came to our world, that's how our origin story starts. And it tells of how we came to be in this valley and that we have lived there ever since. And, and I can't speak strongly enough about the spirit of that place and the, and the sense of connectedness that I feel when I'm, when I'm at home in, in my home community and in our lands and, and with my family there. But it has been extraordinarily difficult to maintain our connections because the land has been impacted and our community has been impacted and, and we continue to be impacted and, and it's multiple impacts now and it's, kind of frightening to some extent, like, well, to a great extent, really, like even right now in, in uh, Victoria, and, and I think Janet, you might be calling in from Victoria as well. We're experiencing a, a, a significant weather event in that we've had so much rain come down within the last say 18 hours that there's massive flooding that's happening and it's, it's creating all kinds of chaos. And, and so, I, so I started to create work, so kind of reflecting, you know, my concerns around, you know, what is happening out in the land. And uh, I have to say, we've created these works and, and put them in institutions and, and people have shown an interest in them. Um, but the changes, you know, that I've been hopeful for in the dialogues created around these pieces, I don't see happening rapidly enough. And, and I have to say, I was disappointed 
with the outcomes from the, the recent meetings, the international meetings regarding climate and the environment. And I'm only saying this because I see these impacts increasing since 2010 in, in our community when we were massively flooded out. I see these impacts increasing and, and it's not just the flooding, it's now forest fires. So now we're starting to experience the smoke in the summers. And it's, it's almost this heightened sense of um, kind of pending catastrophe. You know, we're waiting for catastrophe to, to, to catastrophe to occur, and uh, and and not seeing the appropriate action on behalf on the part of the Canadian government to address that. So, I guess as a as a creative person who's trying to create these expressions, I, I have to say. Like they 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 are leaning more towards kind of like this feeling of urgency. It has become extraordinarily urgent, and uh, I do believe in these dialogues. I I'm grateful for the other um, panelists who are here today, and I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to to speak to these issues in, in a collective way, so that perhaps we can find some ways to continue to voice the urgency of the situations that we face. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. Our next speaker is Carla um, Hemlock, and she will take up the next conversation. Next minute, no. <laughs> Uh, my English name is Carla Hemlock. I am a Bear Clan woman from Gahnawage. Um, our community is on the side of the St. Lawrence River, and we're right across from Jukjage, what you know to be as Montreal. Um, I've lived here my whole life except uh, maybe at times traveling with my family who did ironwork um, because we're an ironworking community. And uh, so I've traveled the ironworking um, route with my family, but we always come home. Uh, and this is my home and I've been here for 60 years, uh, raised my family, have my studio. And uh, yeah, I'm from Gahnawage. Uh, part of uh, some of the work that I do is both in textiles and uh, mixed media. Um, uh, a lot of the work that I'm known for is through my quilting. I do uh, beadwork uh, on my quilts. A lot of my quilts are statement pieces and they're actually meant to um, start a conversation. Uh, some of those conversations are um, maybe difficult ones that people don't want to talk about, but some it becomes easier to talk about it when they're through a quilt. Um, I do uh, collaborative work with my husband, uh, cradle boards. We do both traditional style cradle boards and the most recent work within the past maybe 10, 15 years has been statement pieces on cradle boards. Um, you know, those, those cradle boards are for our future. There are future babies in there there are future generations. So there are statement pieces on there. And a number of them had to do with uh, the changing world that we're living in, in regards to uh, our natural world. In our communities, uh, uh, you know, we're no different than anyone else in what we're experiencing. It seems that um, I'm not sure about the States, but I know a lot in Canada, uh, a lot of major industry is right in our backyard. It's, we have lead plants right across the street from our high schools. Um, we, have, um, we have industry that shouldn't be near our communities, but they are. Um, it's greatly affected our communities. Uh, we've had the St. Lawrence carve right through our village. 
we lost our connection with the river when they put a seaway through. So now we're not on the river, but we're on a seaway. Um, so a lot of these things really affect our communities, but they also affect our outlook. And it, it does have a, a, a big impact. I mean, we, we still, we go, when we go to ceremony or even in the schools in their daily, we have this, it's called a, a Hondagari Wadekwa. And it's the words that become, that are before all else. And this is a daily thing that we do. And it's giving acknowledgement to the natural world. I mean, everything that we do is through those words. And we start each day by giving those words to the natural world. Um, but we're watching it. I can look outside my window and see that it's changing by our trees. We have our ash trees that are all just dying. Uh, we have our basket makers that have a very limited time on when they're going to be um, having to look for other materials because there's no more black ash for their baskets. Um, and this is all the East Coast. It's not just my community. We're talking about the basket makers in Maine right up into Michigan. Um, so we, it, all of us, we look outside our, our doors and we see the changes. I mean, you'd have to be blind if you didn't. And I, I think it's a good conversation. I think uh, you know, for inviting me to give my two cents into this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing how this dialect goes around, um, you know, goes around and uh, uh, yeah. So thanks. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, uh, we will come back around again to everyone. Our next speaker, is um, Beth Roach. Hi, Beth, thank you for coming. Well, no, and uh, Skinaha, can say Beth Roach. I am not away. Uh, so I'm coming to you from Eastern North Carolina. It's wonderful to go after um, Ms. Carla. I'm your Southern Haudenosaunee sister. <laughs> so we not away um, over a thousand years. We're up with our our, our northern families until Goodmine uh, sent us down to this region and said, go to where the cypress and the pine are sunken. And so behind me, you'll see a cypress tree that used to have many other cypresses around it. And, and these trees are only able to grow and nurture on a shoreline. So I took this picture on a kayak and to the right of looking at the tree to a ways away is the shoreline. So there's been quite uh, uh, an impact of sea level rise already uh, where we are where we are sitting. So I'm on I'm at the bottom of our of our watershed. The Chowanda River is as near where I am, but I'm from the headwaters, uh, the Blackwater River and the Nottaway, and what is known as Virginia, make the Chowan Carolina border and come on down. I was raised in between two watersheds, though. Um, I might, there's my the county that I live in is bisected by the two, and where I was born and raised was. Uh, on the Surrey side of the James River. So looking directly at, Ames, at Jamestown Island. And now where I live is close to site X. And so two places of the earliest of the colonizers arrival uh, to North America. And with that history, we have been as Nottaway people, as Iroquois speakers, a little bit further inland, we have been in the shadow of, of those ancient stories, right, that, that started in the 1600s that focused a lot on Powhatan and Pocahontas. And, and we are now waking up, collectively we, as to there are so many more histories to be told. And so I, as a little girl, grew up wondering where the Nottaway stories were, knowing that there was um, so much of that missing. And, and also uh, was born and raised in a river that had been shut down to fishing because of a toxic contaminant called kipone. So they couldn't drink the water, you couldn't fish, um, but we're river people. So we swam in it anyway, because what do you do? <laughs> this, is, this is who we are. Uh, so within my lifetime, I've seen a river rebound. I've seen uh, the James River um, come to a remarkable resilient place. And I've seen my people uh, work together to re, you know, enter the narrative. And so my 
my art is, is history keeping. I'm a public historian and um, my mediums are through media, memory and chatter, I'll just get the gab. And um, the first story that I learned to tell within our community uh, was the story of creation of a sky woman. And um, it's amazing to me how much that I learn from that story every time I think about it and every time I read it or find other versions because it's really just um, articulates how interdependent we are within the natural world. And when you take that with the words become before all else, it's really um, just these original instructions that our ancestors left for us. And they're so critical for us now. Um, so my, um, my upbringing has, has taught me that we need to return to these roots, right? And we need to make sure the world knows who we are. Um, but I do feel that urgency, like we have this climate urgency going on. And so we have to reinstate our teachings and adapt all these things in real time um, as, as we are you know, trying to do our best to, to adapt to what's happening around us. And so I use a lot of our storytelling in activism and community organizing. I've done it in, in not great ways and I've had it in successful ways and it's all a learning process. Um, and now uh, I'm just so delighted to be here to share uh, more from that work and just honored to be here with all y'all in Nawe uh, for having me here. Thank you so much, Beth. Our last speaker um, from this round is Janet Rogers. Hello, Hello everyone. Hi. Yeah. Uh... Everybody, uh, my name is uh, Janet Rogers. I want to say, Yonyatsem de Gawalagua. De Gawalagua is uh, one of the names, if you look for it, as uh, Sky Woman's daughter. Uh, and that name means uh, like a small breath or like a, like a breeze. Um, like when you speak, you create this breath and this breeze. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a poet and a media producer and I'm a new publisher with the Ojisto publishing label and um, Marianne, I'm, I moved home, eh? So you're saying I, I, I was in Victoria, but I was in Victoria. I was in uh, Coast Salish territory, uh, living as a guest for 25 years on the West Coast and um, hosted very, very well over there. And that's where I became a writer. Uh, you know, having started as a visual artist, really baby, baby little career as a visual artist, and then uh, living on the West Coast, just said, you know what, you're a writer. So I, I blame the West Coast for being a writer, um, which is wonderful because it's brought me into all kinds of wonderful different places. And I think the first thing, since, you know, I'm hearing a couple of the speakers this afternoon talk about, you know, our or our origin stories, wherever we happen to originate from. And I think that that's so, so important. When I uh, mentor other writers, that's the first thing I say, tell me what your origin story is, know what that is. And when I think about the Sky, our Sky Woman origin story, I mean, she's falling down from up in a different atmosphere, a different realm, if you will, into a world that is completely flooded with water. The whole world is water world. And she's landing into this new um, uh, environment, if you will, and having to kind of like be, you know, cr creative uh, problem solve uh, in, in, in that story. So we see that happening from the very start. How are you dealing with your environment, you know? And I just think that that is so, so important. And then subsequently what happens in that story too is we see that Sky Woman and her daughter, and it just seems like every other woman who pops up in that story gets murdered. And I take great issue with this. And I have yet to find an answer as to why, why is that happening, even in the origin story. Um, but anyway, uh, the part that I think that uh, my craft as a poet uh, plays in addressing environmental issues, climate issues, is that in creative voice, we get to produce these markers in time um, through the content of the work. And before coming home and during the time that I was hosted so well on Coast Salish territory, I was indeed traveling so, so much as we all were, you know, back then. And um, always very, very inspired by the places where I visited. And one of those places was the interior of what the so-called British Columbia in Merritt, uh, BC, 
which now, I mean, is looking like a big disaster right now. And, and I was visiting and I'm pretty sure it was um, late spring, I, I would go to the interior to go collect the sage because they had, you know, sage is like it's bumper crop, it's everywhere. And uh, that spring, that late spring in 2005, I'm going to say it was, it, there was like this devastating flood that just, you know, raged through there. And Marianne, remind me, that's Thompson River or is that Fraser through, through Merritt? We just lost her. Either either one of I mean, and I should have I should have reminded myself. Uh, <laughs> tell me what it is. I, I'm not sure. It's uh, one of the two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're well. That's what Google's for. Anyway. Um, so uh, go, visiting that territory in that particular year, I saw the aftermath of this of this flood and the vegetation was affected and of course the banks of the rivers and were affected and and it was at that same time that uh right the news the information about residential school was just starting to kind of blossom up into uh our consciousness into the public consciousness and i was so affected by that parallel that I wanted to write about that. Whereas, you know, when we see the banks of our rivers expand and, and overflow, that water is becomes representative of our emotions and um, having, you know, having um, that information flood into our consciousness about residential school was to me what I saw happening on that land in Merritt. And so I, I, I cannot speak about climate and environment without speaking about the people and our history. And I mean, I could go on and on, on and on about that, but in, as you probably know that on Six Nations, you know, we're, we're again, the cyclical uh, events of land retention uh, keeps happening over here. So we currently have an active land uh, back uh, uh, um, movement uh, that we had happening in 2000, five 2006 too so you know and we're doing it again because and we retain our lands not to develop them but to maintain it for our for our people because otherwise the encroachment will see us moved right out if we if we don't fight back so i i think that those things come into play as well when we're talking about climate because climate is um, affected by land and the and we as people are affected by that land and the climate and it's all very connected as we've been saying so far in this chat. So I'll just leave you with that and I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you everyone. Um, some of the, the aspects of our conversation I think are, are tied with the changing land uh, the removals because of climate and, um, and, and our reactions to them as people and uh, people in tribes, people in communities that are, that are reacting to the environment that's changing right before our very eyes. Um, uh, Choctaw and people, our story isn't that we fell from the sky, but we came up uh, tunneled up through the mound uh, and through Mother's Navel, again, the land. And we came out as a uh, kind of crawdad, crawfish people, and we pulled off uh, the, uh, the pinchers and combed our long hair and we became red people. And laying on that red dirt um, at that time, and I think a lot, like all of you, I think a lot of the, that origin story of we came up through the land. Peter Pinchland, our, one of our chiefs, told another story about us coming up from the Gulf. Um, and again, that was a flood and we, we came onto land and became the people we are today. So it's clear to me from our stories that our our people have had challenges due to weather events in time memorial. But moving forward, um, I'd, I'd like to talk about the, the, the grief and joy. There's the joy of, 
of trying to reconstruct our lives as tribal people, as indigenous people. There's the grief that we're suffering from the loss of um, trees. Many of you have talked about trees from the loss of our, the landscape that's changing right before our eyes. Um, here in Georgia, we've had an influx of these Jaro spiders and they are not indigenous but they are killing our indigenous spiders. And the jarro is about this size. I think it, it, it has come on ships. And I have throughout my uh, yard, these giant, they're beautiful, they're giant webs. And our old timers used to say when the, when the spiders make large webs, it's going to be very harsh times, harsh, harsh weather. So I'd like to, to maybe for us to have a second go around and talk about our grief and joy. What are the, what are the, the ways in which we're, we must be prepared for what is coming? And do we want to start and go in the second, the same direction that we went before? So should I start with uh, Jennifer? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm like, should I start with the grief or the joy? Um, I'll start with both. Um, I mean, the joy today is the same joy I felt as a kid um, when I first started writing. I was living in Colorado Springs. And so that story of Muscogee and Southeastern people's story of spilling from the spine of turtle um, and mother um, down to head east from the mountains. I remember looking at Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs as a kid, it was in my window, and how it would change every day and how beautiful it was and different lights and clouds and shades of green and snow. And I realized there what power there is in recognizing that the earth systems are the same systems of breath and body that determine our lives as humans. And I remember wanting to write about this, but there are no words that could translate the awe and the power of that recognition. Yet for some reason I chose words as the mechanism for generating awe. Um, I do feel that awe elevates awareness. And another impulse that drives my writing and creates joy is, and grief, is the awareness that language and then environment language and the natural environment are interwoven that language is changed by and changes the ecosystem. And I think we all have our own ways of knowing how that is. I can speak about just looking, as I'm a late learner of Muscogee language, thinking about how vastly the landscape of the Southeast changed since the late 1800s, since the late 1700s, especially during that century, um, and how Muscogee language we had to adapt and change. Living in the swampy Southeast to the dry Oklahoma, we were trying to figure out, we had to come up with new words for different plants and birds. Um, language also changes the landscape because we language our future with our stories, our determinations of what we're going to do. We put language on things that can be very destructive. Um, colonial languages have been very destructive. Um, colonial practices that we language become destructive. Um, so I guess the questions that propel me and also confound me and halt me in my days where grief is stronger is how can we language our changing environment? Our environment has always been changing, but this is particularly acute. Um, how can we language responsibly in our efforts to rebalance our humanity with the environment of the earth? Um, what you spoke about, Carla, about the cradle board really struck me as this kind of art art um, intervention that's really just, this is the future. Um, and one of the profound areas of grief for me is this feeling that I don't know what seven generations is going to look like. Now, carbon takes 100 years to leave. Its life cycle is 100 years like seven generations is like 140 years. And just in the last century alone, in the last seven generations, um, greenhouse gas concentrations 
are at their highest levels in 2 million years. We did that in a century. Um, so we need to look, so we are looking to that. And that's where my grief comes in is, what is the next 140 years gonna look like? Um, like the only way, and I just think that's where art comes in because we have to be able to imagine a different future. Um, we have to imagine different possibilities, reevaluate our notions of progress, value, efficiency, accessibility, interconnectivity. The only way we're gonna cut out carbon emissions is if we believe in other ways of living. And we can say, you know, tribally and as indigenous people, you know, that we believe in other ways of living, but we have to, we all have to activate them in our lives. Um, and that's real. And there, that's where art becomes a necessity because it can, art, poetry, it can help us see something in a different way. It can help us change. And I think we need it. Thank you. Um, Marianne. Yeah, thank you for those words. Yeah, there's medicine in that to hear the similar reflections on what is happening, um, you know, back through what you're saying to myself and my own experience. I could start with the grief first, and then I'll head towards the, the hope. Um, you know, the, the grief is profound. It, it's, uh, you know, originally before the escalation of the climate change, um, when, I was, when I was really, you know, focused on the political advocacy and what was happening in our communities, um, I was doing that as a reaction to how much death we were experiencing. You know, the reality of our lives in our, in our communities was that uh, really, we were going from one funeral to the next funeral to the next funeral. And that had a tremendous amount to do with colonization and what had happened to us. Um, but now we have this double impact of, of climate change and um, there's a, an additional layer of grief there. And, it, and it's a, an additional layer of grief for the land. You know, you know, I feel like I've carried mourning for our nations um, most of my life. Um, and, and now I, there's this additional layer of mourning that I feel for the land itself. You know, I go home and I look at the mountains and I look at the trees and I, I look at the river and I, there, there's an, a sense of, um, you know, struggle, struggle. And then on the flip side of that, when I go home and I see the mountains and the trees and the river and I see their resiliency, you know, they have survived, particularly we live under this one mountain that we call it Wuxo, and that mountain every day is a companion to us. And I find such comfort in it, you know, because every day it was a companion to my grandmother and my grandfather and my great grandparents and their great grandparents, all the way to the very beginning, they talk about this mountain. And that gives me great comfort because this mountain has been there. It has survived. It, it has shown resilience. And my hope lies in the lessons that our people were able to pass down to us despite the efforts of the Canadian government to suppress those lessons and to, to try to make us forget them. You know, we still remember them. And there's great joy, I feel, in knowing these stories, learning these stories, and then and then helping to reteach these stories within our community. And those stories in particular, they talk about challenges in life. And um, I've, you know, recent ones that I've really been looking at really talk about the role of women and the strength of women. And, and, and to me, this really lifts me up because our, our communities have really taken on a lot of masculine, patriarchal, colonial norms. And, and we need to, to push back on that because when I'm, going through our ancient stories, it's not like that. Women are powerful and, and women are recognized for their power. So we need, you know, there's hope in returning to that and also to change then this kind of colonial patri pat patriarchy of extraction and of treating the land as if it's an object to be kind of, I guess, you know, more or less pillaged. Um, so, so there's so much to be done, but there is so much that can be done. And that gives me great hope 
So um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, um, Carla. Oh boy. Uh, well, this is a heavy topic. <laughs> My gosh. Uh, you know, I have to start with grief also. Um, but we have to realize we've been in grief for the past since the settlers landed here. I mean, this is nothing new to us. It may be new to non-Native people who are experiencing what we've been experiencing for the past since the settlers arrived. Um, this is not new to us, this grief, this change. But we've learned to navigate it, we've learned to adapt, and we've also learned to survive it. We've been displaced from our homelands, displaced from our communities, um, name it. We can go on and on and on, and there's not enough time to even go on. Um, you know, they created schools for us to be civilized human beings, uh, schools for us to forget who we are. Our communities had to go underground and our societies, our medicine societies had to go underground. Um, and these are not old stories. This is in my lifetime. This is, I know these stories. So when you talk about grief, Heck, we're pretty good at it. We're really good at it. But we're also good at looking forward. We're also really, really good at navigating it. I mean, when our grandmothers told us, you know, there's coming a time when you have to buy water. And we all laughed. We said, what are you talking about? They used to tell us that, you know, it's coming. You're going to have to buy water. And everybody would say, are you kidding? No way. Now they're talking about buying air and that's gonna come and that's gonna come. There's so many things that, there's a lot of stuff coming. We know it, our seers know it, our medicine people know it. And all we can do is keep putting our foot forward every day. And we're gonna, we're gonna come through it we're gonna really come through it a whole lot better than people who are not prepared for it or who are just starting their grief. Non-native people can't really understand this. They're, they're in the beginning of their grief and they don't know, they can't handle it. Heck, we're, we're pretty good at it. When I look at the artwork right now, I think that the arts are critical. Uh, we're coming into the winter time. The winter time is when our storytellers come out. That's an amazing time for our people. Those storytellers come and tell those stories that have been told for hundreds of years. That's why we're able to have this amazing oral tradition because they tell those stories every single year and the little ones are gonna to listen to those stories. And one day they're gonna be the storytellers. It's a time for the arts. It's a time for the beaters to sit down. All the harvesting is done, the work is done. It's the winter time is time for the arts. I can only speak for myself and my, my husband because we both, that's what we do. We do artwork. And our, we laugh with each other because we said, you know, we're kind of, uh, we're like 60 years old. Our eyes are not all that strong like they used to be. So we have to really choose carefully what's the messages that we want to get out and that's what we've been doing our messages are coming through our cradle boards they're coming through our clothing they're coming through the artwork and you know there's a lot of people that don't want to hear it they did a lot of maybe some of our own people don't want to hear it but there's people who don't want to hear this and they can step back and not listen to you not listen to us speak but boy that image is gonna be put into their heads. If they see that artwork, that image is gonna stay there. That poem that they hear, that's what's gonna be embedded in them. 
So yeah, grief, heck, we're masters at it. But you know what? We're also masters at surviving it. And that's where I see us going. We're gonna survive this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beth. Oh, and um, so I'll take y'all back about a year ago with some work that I'm doing here in our shared waters of the watershed that crosses over two states now, two EPA regions, six tribes, tangentially, and then within a region that has been heavily impacted of colonialism and divide and conquer and um, you know, racism, internal, external, gnarliness, you name it, displacement of land, all of these things. Um, so about a year ago, started this Water Stories campaign with Olympia water scientist, Randy Manuel, and um, some other folks in, in the project where we are, we were asking folks um, to share with us their memories of the water, what they loved about the water, um, what changes have they seen, what threats are they seeing, and, and what is the future they wanted for it. And to prompt people to respond, I would go out on my kayak and would, would go Facebook Live and all these different places. And people were piping in and they got to be really popular. And um, from that learning, I you know, realized just how many people, it just it crystallized, you know, people were piping in from the diaspora. I mean, like so many folks were removed from the waters that I was broadcasting from that they are just so enamored to be on the water and to be seeing it in real time. And they'd ask me a question and I'd turn the camera and I would be able to engage with them. And then it started to help us see that, you know, that we need to bring people home so badly. People need to come home and be on the water with us. And that, yes, it was cool that they saw Beth on the water, but what they were really responding to was wanting to be on the water with us. And so uh, that got us to thinking, well, okay, like we're on to something, we need to bring people home. You know, a lot of folks went up to the DC area, Hampton Roads, Raleigh, you name it, urban centers. And one of the first steps that we are recognizing is that we wanna, you know, bring people back onto the waters and it's, and it's really just to, to mourn what we've lost and, and to mourn, and I mean, there's a lot of frustration about how we're engaging with each other and, and to hopefully um, just come to some seat, some sort of eye to eye so that we as not away people, Meharan, Tuscarora, Lumbee, you name it all around, like that we can bind together and heal not only from the loss of our land and the changes that we're seeing in the landscapes that we can recognize that connection with each other and then from those experiences, you know, see the resiliency, just the, the miracle that we're here. And also nature is gonna show you all the ways that she rebounds every day. I mean, y'all, I know y'all seen those trees that fall over and then one branch is like, nope, I'm gonna be in the trunk now. And it keeps going up. I mean, that's, you know, there's symbols throughout nature that shows us that it's gonna be okay. And while we might be losing, um, you know, our cypress trees on the natural shoreline, you know, there are ways that we can help the shorelines mend and, and help by looking at the next 80 years. Like we don't have that crystal ball, but we can arm ourselves with the best science so that we can see the future as best as we can and that we, we can hopefully collectively adapt to that. And so for us, um, we, have, um, we're, we have a bunch of paddles lined up where we're really just gonna get on the water together. And one, to just do what we need to do personally to mourn the losses and the changes. Um, and, and by using mourning as a, as that grieving process, as we've all experienced so much of, it's, it is a process. And once you process, once you honor that process, then you're able to get to action and you're able to get more to that place of, we can do something about this. And, um, and we hope and we know that every time we're on the water together, that it is a joyful time and that it is a healing time. And so uh, it's, 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 we have to hold both <laughs> with us at the same time. And we have to do it in, in, in place so that the ancestors and all of our relations all around feel that love and, and are able to go forward with us. Thank you, Beth. Janet, bring us home. All right, <laughs> I'll do my best here. Well, to address the grief and the hope and the joy of, uh, of this environmental reality that we're all addressing here, I can sum it up in a little story of uh, what happened when I first got back home. And I don't know if I, in the introductions I even said I'm like transmitting to you from Six Nations of the Grand River. I don't know if I said that. Anyway, um, so coming back home in the summer of 2019, 
that fall, there was a wonderful uh, thing that happened and that was um, some uh, longhouse people. They uh, opened up a session for folks who just wanted to get together. It was really kind of a closed thing for Haudenosaunee people, for folks that just wanted to get together and get like a little refresher about how we conduct ourselves as Haudenosaunee people. And this is, you know, this, this is what we do. And this, and this also uh, is what we do when we talk about the Gaswante, the two row wampum, is that we remind everybody, we polish that chain and we remind people about that original relationship that we had with the first settlers uh, that was in reference to the environment because those early Dutch settlers, we realized weren't gonna go anywhere anytime soon. So we had to create a relationship, a, a kind of a blueprint of a, of a way to conduct ourselves in that relationship with them and with the environment. And that's where that two row wampum came in, the Gus Wampum. Um, but when I got home, this, uh, there was actually a couple of those sessions and they were like four day, like, you know, kind of boot camps, if you will, that uh, were created out of a grief or a concern uh, about people not going to Longhouse anymore. Longhouse is a commitment, you know, huge commitment. And I'm not Longhouse and I have my reasons for that. And mostly they have to do with being a single child-free individual and Longhouse has a lot to do with families and, you know, gaining this knowledge to pass on and so on and so forth. But um, the, what I learned in those boot camp sessions coming back home was that everything we do is number one, it's about gratitude. And number two, it's about the giving gratitude to the site, to the seasons, the cycles and the, and the crops and, and just making prayers for the crops to come, you know, strawberry ceremony, gr green corn ceremony, so on and so forth. You know, you're always, you're always looking to the horizon to see what's coming. And so these sessions, again, to me, they were like a response to a grief uh, that, you know, we were, people in, the, in this community were feeling. And as you know, and as maybe this is across the board for indigenous language, our languages are very verb-based, they're action-based. And so when we feel like there is something to address, it's about getting down to it. And yeah, sure, there's gonna be climate talks. Let them talk. We got, we got our shit to do, you know? And that is to bring the people together. And the other note I wanted to make about, um, about those sessions was that it really helped everybody to gain a greater sense of responsibility and a deeper sense of, re of relationship that one has with the environment. When you have these, these traditional teachings, you walk on the land differently. You know, if you have a deeper, and that, and this can go like all the way into, you know, settler nation people. If they only knew that they could have a deeper relationship with the land that they, that they occupy, then that's where you make a change. You, you, you give them a little bit of teachings in trust, and help them to gain a better understanding and a better relationship with the land that they occupy. Because you, you, it's a, it's, and that's how you affect change in anything, in, in racism, in social understanding. It's like you have to have a relationship with it for you to, to gain, to have a better sense of responsibility with it as well. So I was really grateful that, you know, the Longhouse people opened up those sessions. And for someone like me who is again coming home, uh, to to kind of uh, root myself back here, you know, uh, and so that's that, that's my response to to grief and and hope and joy that you know these teachings are still alive. Just access them, man. You know. Thank you so much, uh, Janet, and I want to thank the entire panel for their time and their energy and their sharing their stories uh, during, for this event. Um, I also wanna thank the people whose land this is, thank the panelists for coming together and sharing their stories. Thank the University of Georgia Wilson Center for providing a space for us to be able to share our stories together. 
And are there any final comments um, um, that we feel we must say before we close out this wonderful hour together? I can say I learned a lot from each of you. Each of you women are so beautiful in light and the love that you are giving to your communities. And um, it's been an amazing experience for me uh, to be with you over this hour. I hope that we can uh, cross paths again. Any final comments from anybody? Um, I just want to say uh, thank you for um, having me. And uh, I uh, was truly honored to listen to all of your words. And uh, I hope that um, many other people are able to tune in at another time and listen to what everyone had to say. Um, just maybe a final thing from me on when you were talking about change. Um, for me, change starts with myself. It doesn't start with anybody else. I don't expect anyone to change if I'm not going to change. Mm. Um, and I won't look at the next person to say, what are you doing? Because quite honestly, I'm still driving a car. I'm still gassing it up. I'm still a consumer. I'm still a buyer. I'm contributing as much as uh, the next person is. So if there's gonna be change, it's gonna start with me first. And that's something that I have to work on is do I still wanna drive a gas car? Do I still wanna be a consumer? Um, but yeah, that changes with me. You're so right, Carla, thank you for those words. And we as women and Amongst our tribal peoples, we have uh, much to learn, but we also have things to share with our communities as well. So you're so right. We have to think about what it is that we're doing. You know, I'm with you. I drive work every day. So these are big challenges for us. And I know that, that we will meet, meet, meet them somehow some way. Um, again, this has been an amazing conversation with five uh, Indigenous women that uh, have come to share their stories. Um, you can always, um, uh, we can always get together again and see where we are in the future. I would love that. And um, I thank you all for being here and being at the university and helping us to talk about this conversation. It is difficult, but we have to do it going forward.